Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jan Roos, and I am here with a bit of a philosophical episode. So I was thinking about the concept of freedom the other day because I think a lot of people go into business for themselves in the pursuit of freedom. I think a lot of people choose high-paying careers like going into law for freedom for that matter. And I think freedom ultimately means different things to different people. But for a lot of us, the reality of doing what we want comes down to money in the end of the day. And for business owners, we, we have sort of a, a different reality than, than people who are in high paying jobs, for example. But a lot of you know experts, financial advisors, authors, business brokers, uh, business brokers who are authors, et cetera, recommend setting a number, right? And there's some kind of interesting and, and more or less conservative expectations for how much you need to live to do and so-and-so and not have to respond to anyone and all that stuff. But another version that I think is a little bit more fun to talk about is the concept of FU money. And I'm going to try to keep our clean rating here, so we'll keep it F. But anyways, uh, from, from Urban Dictionary, the definition of FU money is the exact amount of money required in order to tell an individual or organization to go F themselves without facing repercussions. And if you kind of let that concept sit for a little bit, it feels pretty nice. And I think it's a lot of reasons why you know people who are more oriented towards that kind of approach for life are more likely to be pursuing you know freedom through an avenue like a business as opposed to doing it on their own, because it's, it's kind of tough. I mean, very obvious way to not have F you money is if the money that you're getting is dependent on people that you can't say F you to, right? But I want to get into some specific details because I think in the process of pursuing freedom, a lot of people end up letting go of freedom. And sometimes these are pitfalls that people can't get out of, right? And I do think just to kind of spoil the end, there is a way to pursue freedom in a way that preserves one freedom in the process. And I'm going to get into how people do that. But first, I kind of want to talk about an interesting story that uh, is from a personal friend of mine. And this is a guy, I'm going to be very careful to not provide too many details. So this ends up not getting back to him, but I don't mind if it gets back to him, but these are, you know, privileged investment details and that kind of stuff too. So anyways, a good friend of mine was living in, I was living in New York at the time and he was visiting because he had some investor meetings and it was really interesting. Every time we ended up coming in, uh, you know, he would always go meet with people at the Carnegie Club. He'd have to talk to all these different uh, advisors, consultants, investors, blah, blah, blah. And he was running a very, very successful tech business. But we're good friends. Uh, we would always catch up at the bar, have a couple of drinks, talk about life, all that stuff. And basically, at the time that he ended up visiting, uh, in this particular instance, his company was being groomed for sale. And he had offers on the table anywhere between 50 and $100 million. And he had a really, really big stake, not 100%, but a very, very solid stake because he'd mostly bootstrapped this business. He had taken some investor money, and that's going to come into the uh, story very shortly. But basically, if the company had ended up getting sold, like he would have been well into the eight figures in profit and what he was able to take home out of that deal, which is you know awesome money, honestly. That's that's higher than my uh, you know FU money number, to be completely honest. So anyways, he told me something and this really blew my mind. He said, you know, we're doing all this stuff. We're building this team. You know, I have all this thing. I'm, I'm staring down the barrel of this acquisition, which might be the biggest event in my life. And every single time you and I meet up, I'm always jealous. I always wish I could trade places with you because you're in the situation where you don't have to listen to anyone. And I have all these investors breathing down my neck, all these different things, going through this due diligence process, all this stuff. I really don't feel like I'm in control of my life and in control of my company anymore, which is really, really a huge bummer. So basically in this moment, like when he was reaching for the brass ring of total freedom, he realized that he'd given up control of his, his life I mean, his day to day. So temporary freedom was gotten rid of for the ultimate freedom. And the unfortunate denouement to this story is that he ended up losing the company. Um, he was actually voted out by the shareholders and he ended up having sort of a hostile takeover. And basically the, you know, the company ended up getting run into the ground. So he never ended up cashing in on that, which is a really, really sad story. But basically I want to kind of get into a couple different situations 
that I think are these kind of toxic traps for this. And the first one, of course, is investors, right? Whenever we take money from people, we are sort of beholden to people like that, right? I've had a lot of friends similar to that too. I mean, uh, we initially knew each other from the Canadian startup culture around you know, Montreal, McGill University. And I know a lot of people who ended up taking money out of that too. And it's a fantastic situation. There's obviously benefits outside of the money that can come with getting that in terms of connections and, and you know advice and mentorship and that kind of stuff too. But at the end of the day, those guys aren't able to do 100% of what they want, right? So there are you know strings attached with anything that has to come into investors. The second one I want to kind of bring into, and this is something that uh, hits me pretty personally. So I ended up bootstrapping Case Fuel 100%, and this was on my own without any partners. And this was a deliberate decision <laughs> that was informed by a terrible partnership that I'd had in the company that I launched previous to Case Fuel. So it's also a really tough situation. Like I said, there's a lot of benefits to partnerships as well. I think when you have complementary skill sets and it's something that makes a lot of sense, partnerships can be great. But again, it's a marriage. If you're in the situation where the incentives aren't aligned, and I could probably do an entire podcast on any of these situations, I think a lot of times partnerships can be a really, really dangerous thing in terms of the freedom that people actually have, right? One that I think is a little bit more subtle is when you're running a referral-based practice. So if you think about it, there are a lot of these little micro commitments that you have to have. And I'll go with the example of BNI in this instance. So I did BNI for a couple of years. I know BNI is a huge thing with a lot of attorneys, especially in the local space. But BNI is great when it works. You know, it's it's referrals, it works in, but you know, you kind of have to pay the piper. If BNI ends up becoming 30, 40, 50% of the business that you're coming in, well, guess what? You can't take a vacation <laughs> for more than a couple of weeks because otherwise you're gonna lose your seat in the in the, in the process. And then you also have to deal with all the, the you know, the different gobbledygook, right? So it's like we have the situation where you have people that are getting referred to you and then you're hopefully doing good work for them and more people are getting referred, but you have these little commitments, right? You have the you know, hey, sorry, you know, I know you, you guys are looking for, you know, estate planning clients, but, you know, my grandma's got this landlord tenant issue and, you know, I've sent you a ton of business, man. Can you just do me a solid blah, blah, blah. Again, you know, that's not exactly an FU money situation. Nothing against anyone's grandma, but, you know, it's it's tough to kind of have those situations where you're pulled out of your zone of genius and taking time away from yourself and doing your own business and doing your own best work with the people that you want to be working with because you have to satisfy some some external relationship, right? And you know, a lot of these things happen too. If, if this is with a, you know, is just an example of an organization, but um, it gets really tough too, because if you have the situation, um, we've been on the side of this, not anytime recently, but you know, we've had referral partnerships that were tough because they represent a big part of our business at some point. So when we had demands that were coming from those partners that were out of scope and, you know, not, not necessarily the, you know, hey, I'll help my grandma out with this landlord tenant issue, but similar stuff, you know, ridiculous requests, trying to ask stuff that we should have never been doing, but kind of got, you know, would, would fade into the line, you know, fade into the, uh, the line items of all the business that we were throwing our way. It was bad. And we ended up having to, you know, default to some of these situations because it wasn't in our best interest to, you know, rock the boat and, and upset these partners, right? You know, I guess if you guys have any large referral partners, maybe you can think of a situation that's similar. So referrals are another thing where it's air quotes free, but you you can ultimately pay in a lot of different ways. And the last thing, and this is something that kind of out of left field, but you know, this is in, in the, and I'm not going to make this a political podcast, but we've had a lot of situations where we've had very prominent people that were dependent on social media platforms and they ended up getting, you know, canceled or deplatformed, right? So another thing too is that if you are dependent on being visible in public opinion, then that actually limits the amount of things that you can say, right? Like I said, I'm not, you know, taking this super hot libertarian take and saying, you know, blah, 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 cancel culture is the problem. But the, the reality is you have to go with the mainstream if you want to be active in the mainstream. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of situations where, you know, you're not able to really say what you want if it's running counter to the narrative that's going on in a given group. In a given, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be mainstream. You're not going to have to be like deplatformed from Twitter or something like that. But again, it's like, you know, you have to play to the audience, right? And the audience of any group, whether it's public or private, has to be, you know, something that you're taking into consideration, right? So those are a couple examples of situations where you definitely can't tell somebody F you <laughs> that uh, I you know, would probably choose to avoid if, if it was my case. But again, these are just kind of some, just, some thoughts I've come to over the years. But I want to flip the script and talk about the situation where you can, right? So how can we get to the position where we're pursuing the ultimate freedom of being able to, you know, sell a business, make enough money that we can really, you know, kick our feet up and, you know, retire to Turks and Caicos or whatever happens to be. And 
not give up freedom in the process. And I want to think about a, a person uh, who is both an example of this and kind of a leader in this space and also sort of an avatar for this entire style of marketing, and that is Dan Kennedy. So I have probably referred to Dan Kennedy a couple of times on the podcast. If you guys have been in the marketing world, he's sort of a hard person to avoid. But basically, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the guy, he is probably the avatar for direct response marketing these days. Um, he's been around for a super long time, but um, a lot of the people, I ended up originally discovering him through Joe Polish and the I Love Marketing podcast way back in the day, but he ended up actually being kind of Joe Polish's mentor, which I found really surprising. And then when I kept going down the line, I kept finding these people who were his disciples. So, you know, I'm also a jujitsu practitioner, huge jujitsu school, school, Lloyd Irvin. He was a, a Dan Kennedy disciple, Perry Marshall, huge AdWords guy I used to follow back in the day. Also, you know, disciple of Perry Marshall, just all these roads ended up leading back to this guy because I think Dan Kennedy is probably the direct marketer and he didn't necessarily invent direct marketing, but he's certainly probably done the best job of popularizing it for the last 30 or 40 years. But, you know, he's kind of the godfather in all these ways. So when we look at Dan Kennedy, his life specifically is very, very interesting. You can read any of his books and he's got a million of these things out. He only responds to people via fax in this 21st century. <laughs> he spends most of his time doing what's called carriage racing. And I, I had to look this up because I'd never heard about it before him, but he basically sits in the back of a sleigh and uh, gets pulled by horses. It's like, you know, basically horse racing for people who are, are bigger than jockeys. And, you know, just kind of, and if anyone wants to, to, you know, deal with him, they have to pay him a huge amount of money. I think it's like 50 or a hundred thousand dollars. And they have to come visit him in um, whatever town he ends up living in in Ohio. So it's kind of an interesting situation. Like he really has not only FU money, but an FU lifestyle. And it's been this way for a really, really long time, right? So he had the situation where he provides so much value that he has truly written his own ticket. If you want to have Dan Kennedy's help, you have to play Dan Kennedy's game. And that's obviously a very extreme example. But one of the things I find super interesting about his disciples is they're all in a very similar position. They're not beholden to anyone, right? And it's kind of interesting because every now and then you're going to have these people that shout each other out, and that's always a plus, right? But for the most part, too, these guys are all independently wealthy. They don't have investors. They bootstrap their businesses. They never have to really worry about money, and they can define their lives on their terms, right? So I want to kind of break down what it takes to get there. And then ultimately, this is sort of how I think the formula is. If you have the situation where, and again, I'm not saying that this is for everybody, but as a hypothetical, if you wanted to get to the situation where you weren't dependent on anyone's favor except for your own in terms of being where you want and what you want to do with your life. So I'll try to encapsulate this into three parts, right? But basically, if you can be in a position where you can profit from people's self-interest, you'll never be dependent on someone's favor again. So I think there's three components to this. And the first one is that you need to be able to sell to an average Joe. This ultimately breaks down to marketing and sales. One of the interesting caveats of this is that if you have something that's too specialized, you need to make sure that you have enough market where you can keep it going, right? If your total addressable market is too small, then you're not going to be able to sell indefinitely. So for most people, for most attorneys, most local businesses, I would recommend going as broad as possible. There's a lot more money, and this is probably the subject of an entire podcast in its own, but one of the very interesting commonalities I've seen with every seven-figure plus estate planning practice that we've ever worked with is that they know how to sell to the everyday person. There's more money money in selling to broke people than there is in selling to the rich and famous. And that's just because there's more people at the pyramid. And you know, when you really think about it, there's actually a lot of ways that people don't realize that they can do to convince someone. And I'll get into this in the, in, in the second point, which is if you can create so much value that both you and your, the other person are coming out on top, then you can win. So the people that have this figured out, the seven-figure practice owners, and a lot of the times too, these guys aren't selling $22 wills or any crazy stuff competing with LegalZoom or that kind of stuff. A lot of these guys are selling stuff for three, four, five thousand dollars for trust packages. And I've heard things, this is one of my favorite quotes from a really, really strong practice owner we've been working with for a long time. You know, we've sold five thousand dollar trusts to people who have less than a hundred thousand dollars in assets. And we've had people that have chiseled us on our, our, our hourly rate that have, you know, seven, eight figures in assets as well, right? And why does this work is because, you know, you're never going to run out of people that have under $100,000 in assets. But why is that person going to end up coming out on top? Because the value, you're exchanging $5,000 of their hard-earned money, but they're getting far in excess of $5,000 in the value that they're getting. These guys are doing trust documents like a lot of other people in the towns they're competing in. They have expertise, right? And we're going to get into that a little bit. 
And most importantly, they're communicating this to the people, right? You're not going to be able to tell them that $5,000 is equal to $1,500 somewhere else if it's from a Google ad. But these guys are doing stuff like seminars and webinars, and they have you know fantastic people in the closing process and the intake process to really put themselves head and shoulders above the other thing too. Uh, and because of that, they have profit, right? You can sell everyone in the world, but if they're getting ripped off and you're not making enough or and slash or you're not making enough money, then you're not going to be able to continue this, right? So the ability to create value and especially communicate value allows there to be enough so both parties are making an air quotes profit on the interaction that's taking place. And the last part I think is having an offer that people can't say no to. So part of this is having the offer being communicated, right? But because these people have a specific approach to these things, and they actually do have a very unique offer. I'm not going to go into any details about it. But you know, in addition to the stuff that they're doing with trust and state planning, it's framed in a different way. They have a lot of really unique branding and process around that stuff people aren't saying no to it in the same way, right? So basically, and the other thing that's kind of interesting too, and going a little bit outside of the legal space, I always find the world of affiliate marketing online super interesting because if you can have a situation where you can say, all right, cool, hey, look, I've got this info product there's a you know eighty percent card close rate and the average card like like you know the average card value is two hundred dollars right so every time you you stick a you know if every time you send a, a click to this page and it ends up making eighty percent times two it's one hundred and sixty dollars you know you're just going to have marketers coming out of the woodwork trying to sell it to, uh, right and even if you don't really need the marketers. Uh, <laughs> You know, you can easily get success with that marketing because the offer is so strong, right? So basically those three elements, right? If we can have, if you can sell to the average Joe, if you can make sure that you're creating so much money that both you and the other person's coming out on top at the same time, and if you have an offer that people can't say no to, then you will be in a position that you will never be dependent on somebody's favor again. I know this is kind of an interesting theoretical episodes, but I'm really intrigued to see what you guys think. And then just, you know, Take an honest look at what you're doing in your life right now. Where do you want to be from a freedom perspective? What are you beholden to? And, you know, as an exercise, what would you need to do to not have to worry about that? I'll let you ponder that. <laughs> and until then, I will see you guys next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Eastern on the Law Firm Growth Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. For show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode.